Um, thank you guys uh, for uh, allowing me to go first. I'm um, uh, in the ICU this week. We have uh, converted the majority of our operating rooms to the ICU. Um, I am going to, to talk about EEG guided sedation management during the COVID crisis. Um, in a uh, pre-COVID world, I was the division chief of uh, neuroanesthesia here. I was recruited about 18 months ago from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Emory University and Georgia Tech, where I uh, spent the beginning of my faculty career. Um, and I uh, am doing this project in collaboration with two um, neurologists that work in the uh, neurophysiology epilepsy monitoring unit, Anil Mendorado and Carl Basil, and another neurologist that works in the neuro ICU named Jan Klassen. I don't have any financial conflict of interest. Um, so, uh, like I said, in the pre-COVID world, I uh, not only uh, uh, have a laboratory where we investigate um, preclinical models of uh, pharmacology, behavior, EEG, especially as it relates to age and the aged brain under anesthesia and how the aged brain wakes up from anesthesia. And uh, that also includes some clinical research with humans, and that's what we're uh, looking at here. I, I also do uh, research on how we uh, wake up our older patients from um, anesthesia after surgery, specifically spine surgery or other uh, large surgeries and kind of look at their cognition afterwards. Um, so just to start with a couple of quick definitions, uh, I assume you guys can see my uh, arrow. Um, yes, we can see it. Perfect. The uh, raw EE, these are uh, frontal EEG traces. This is a um, FDA approved kind of device for um, monitoring um, uh, sedation during um, uh, general anesthesia and surgery. And it's just four frontal electrodes um, uh, to a common reference right in the middle of the forehead and a, um, uh, a EMG electrode. And you can see four top traces and this is your EEG, um, uh, just kind of the raw uh, voltage over time graph here. We have a uh, frequency analysis and that's this multicolored graph here. And then they have, um, many of these devices kind of have a um, uh, simplified version of the EEG down to a single number. Um, a lot of the, the work that's done on EEG, we uh, really try to avoid simplifying it to this uh, single number. I'll tell you a little bit more about or, or the problems that can happen um, with that later. But um, so for a long time, I've been looking at different frequencies in EEG and uh, what they might mean kind of on the left panel. This is um, adequate anesthesia. This is somebody that was having a spine case we kind of turned off the EEG while we flipped them um, prone. And uh, you can kind of see that this is 20 minutes of data going in this frequency. And this is four seconds of EEG right at um, right as the surgery kind of starts. Um, surgery progresses and uh, as the patient's waking up, we flip them back um, supine and, and they're waking up. And you can see that the EEG looks very different. There's a lot more high frequency uh, characteristics here um, in this raw EEG tracing at the top. I like to say that it looks fuzzy. The raw EEG looks fuzzy as the patient is starting to wake up, suggesting that the cortex is more active. Um, and in, while they're unconscious and receiving uh, good pain control, it looks a little bit more like a ribbon there on the left. So uh, we asked ourselves, you know, our frontal EEG monitors helpful for titration of sedative medications in mechanically ventilated COVID patients. The reason why this is really, really important is that we're having a, a hard time, especially in the OR ICUs where we don't have the regular ICU ventilators. The patients that are that require um, mechanical ventilation, um, they are doing a lot of coughing. They um, this coughing probably releases more bradykinins, more um, uh, inflammatory mediators, and it's making um, this kind of vicious cycle where uh, they're, they're staying on the ventilator for a long, long time. And what's what's happening is we we keep going up and up and up on the sedation. Um, to try and get them uh, to uh, sync well with the vent. Um, and this kind of vent dyssynchrony can cause barotrauma, can cause a lot of other problems. And so this high, high levels of sedation um, is contributing to a drug shortage. Um, there are, uh, we're having uh, major issues with um, uh, getting propofol and midazolam and fentanyl, some of our commonly used um, medications for sedation in the ICU. and. Um, this is, uh, this is turning out to be a big problem. 
Additionally, um, there's going to be shortages all over the country, um, especially as the number of COVID cases continues to rise. And so uh, we were wondering, do we need all that sedation? Um, you know, because the, perhaps these patients uh, are being over sedated. The coughing is a brainstem reflex. Um, maybe their cortex um, uh, is not forming a memory. Maybe they are not in pain right now. Um, we just need to kind of control their cough. What often will happen is after high, high doses of sedation and the patient still fails to um, synchronize well with the ventilator, they might uh, choose to give a neuromuscular blockade. And this is medicine that will kind of uncouple the uh, um, musculature from uh, the nervous system. And uh, that, that sometimes helps, but that runs into a, a problem where uh, we might think that these patients that are intubated, um, we want to make sure that they are unconscious and that they're not forming a memory and not able to move while they're in the ICU. So uh, we started, uh, I was kind of uh, consulted by uh, people in the ICU and they wanted me to help with some sedation in some of these very difficult patients. And uh, so I kind of started this observational case series. Um, and you can kind of see that uh, right now uh, we're a little bit higher than 14 now. We've got about uh, 18 but I, I've started the, the manuscript with these first 14 patients. Seven patients are from our converted OR ICUs and seven patients are from other ICUs. Um, the uh, exposures are these uh, adhesive EEG electrodes um, and they're kind of placed over the forehead. And then um, myself and some of the neurologists were doing the EEG interpretation and uh, can, um, uh, letting that uh, information be known to the ICU primary team. And the outcomes that we were looking at were dose reductions of sedative, analgesic, or neuromuscular blocking agents within 24 hours of initiating this monitoring. So these first two are two different patients that um, had been um, intubated and on the ventilator for about four days and uh, were still not sinking well, and uh, they had um, instituted neuromuscular blockade. And you can see that this looks very different than the um, EEG of a, of a nice uh, patient that's, uh, you know, adequately anesthetized for spine surgery, the EEG is very, very flat and it's um, what we would call discontinuous, meaning that it has um, uh, some areas that are uh, less than about two to three uh, microvolts for um, a whole second or longer. And it might be punctuated, as you can see over here on the right, by a little bit of brief cortical activity um, that's at this low frequency. Um, and just to kind of show you how this automatic number uh, might read false um, based on either electrical noise. This, you know, uh, you can see that these two numbers are 25 and 17. The, the manufacturer of these devices would say 25 to 50 is kind of the optimal sedation range. But here we have a 58 and we have an 85. And, and certainly the EEG um, uh, raw tracing doesn't look that different than the ones before. Um, and it's probably artifactual that, that's contributing. Yeah, one, one minute. Sure. Oh, one minute, thanks. So the results are that 86% uh, uh, demonstrated this severely attenuated EEG record, and it's consistent with diffuse cerebral dysfunction or high amounts of sedating medication. And of the two um, patients that were not severely attenuated, only one was really in an optimal sedation level. And that was this patient who had really only been intubated about 24 hour, hours earlier. And so this is a little bit of the demographics. You can see that this is the sedation that they were on when we placed the EEG. And then um, most of them resulted in a big decrease. And I've got that kind of summarized here, where 79% had a decrease in their sedation regimen within 24 hours. Um, and this is, was true whether or not the patients were receiving neuromuscular blockade or not. So basically, to summarize, critically ill patients receiving this high-dose sedation or uh, neuromuscular blocking agents for vent synchrony um, they all have um, a, a lot of either diffuse cerebral dysfunction and or over sedation. And I think that it's probably a combination of both. Um, one of these patients also had a continuous EEG that was a full montage. We saw no focal lesions. So we think that there might be kind of an encephalopathy going on in some of these more severe cases. Um, when we discussed this with the ICU team, they had a reduction in their sedative and analgesic dose. So we're hoping that um, awareness of this can result in um, a bit more of an appropriate use of medications that are critically short supply. And I'll end there, stop sharing, and uh, answer any questions.
Thank you very much, Paul. Um, if there are any question, please uh, uh, raise your hand. No, yes. Uh, I was just wondering what you see about patients coming out of anesthesia after such a long time, since that's what you work on normally anyway. Uh, are you talking about the uh, non-COVID situation or are you talking COVID about right COVID now? Patients. No, these COVID patients that are undergoing relatively long-term anesthesia. Yeah. What about recovery? So, uh, frankly, we don't have a lot of data on that yet because we're kind of in the middle of the pandemic. But out of the one or two patients that I've seen, um, I do see that the EEG uh, starts to recover when their neuro exam starts to recover. I actually think that um, what's going on is uh, later in the disease, instead of being, you know, uh, instead of being mainly an infection that's uh, a viral infection, it turns into more like a vasculitis kind of picture where um, you know, the, the, we see a lot of renal failure, so perhaps the blood vessels in the kidney are affected. We see a lot of uh, pulmonary hypertension where the blood vessels in the lung are affected. And I don't think it's uh, out of question to imagine that um, you know, the blood-brain barrier and the blood vessels of the brain are probably severely affected as well. So I think that um, um, when, as the, the inflammation goes down after the infection is starting to clear, then um, the EEG returns to less of a dysfunctional pattern and looks more like typical sedation. Wonderful. Uh, uh, a different question. So is there any data on whether a higher or lower level of sedation actually has any impact on the ability of the patient to emerge successfully from treatment? Um, certainly not for COVID because we're just too new. Um, but uh, in, in general, um, in the... Um, uh, there are volunteer studies done with healthy people that would suggest that um, in a healthy brain, a very, very large dose of sedation that brings you into an isoelectric EEG does not really have any major effects. I think that there are many of us, though, that believe that the patients that have some underlying chronic inflammation or that maybe um, have uh, other underlying brain issues, that it probably